Hi Heel Squad, it's Kelsey. Do you feel like you're maybe lacking some direction in your life right now? Maybe you're feeling burnt out or like you're heading towards burnout. Maybe you don't know what your purpose is anymore. You feel like you need to redefine success and what that means to you because it's different for all of us. We're talking about all of this today and more with Jenna Kutcher. She's teaching us how to set boundaries in the workplace and really how to tap into our inner power, those feelings, let the feelings we feel guide the way. They're gonna show you where you need to be. So listen, subscribe if you haven't yet, take those notes and enjoy the episode. So hello everybody. Welcome to Better Together. When you know better, you get better. That's our goal here every single day. And today we are really going to get better. Uh, Our quote of the day, it's not always going to be easy and it feels scary at first, but it sure as hell is going to be worth it. You're not waiting for rescue any longer. There's no ticket needed for admission for the life you want. You have permission to explore what you love. Take that deep breath and let that fresh air of your freedom, your clarity, and your dreams fuel your next move. No more waiting for a life you'll live someday. You're living it right now. And that is from Jenna Kutcher, author of How Are You Really? Uh, Living Your Truth, One Answer at a Time. Friends, this book is amazing. Heel Squad, you're going to love it and you're going to love this episode. So Jenna Kutcher is an entrepreneur, digital marketing expert, self-education mastermind, photographer, author, mom. She keeps it real and she's so fun and she's so pure and she's so great. I uh, came across her gold digger, goal digger digger. (laughs) podcast uh, a while ago, over a year ago. And I kept telling Kelsey and Jeff Graham at the time, like, guys, you got to listen to this. Every time I listen, I'm learning something amazing, Mm -hmm. which I hope is what people are saying when they listen to this, right? I think so. Yeah. I mean, yeah, we get that feedback, which is great. Uh, But I was learning so much about like business and marketing there. And so uh, then I ended up at that mastermind event last summer where I got to meet her yeah. and um, we had been talking previously to that um, and she was really helpful with some stuff. And so um, now we're of course like diehard friend, fans and of course friends. And uh, we took, what course of hers did we take that we loved? The Pinterest one. Yeah, we took her Pinterest course yeah. and we built our Pinterest. And the newsletter one. I Yeah, we did both. Yeah. yeah so yeah, yeah. friends... Check out our Pinterest because we got a lot of fun stuff on there. That's thanks right. to Jenna's assistance and how we organized it all. And Queenie has been all over it and working so hard on it. And then, uh, oh, and what just fell? <laughs> One of the flowers. Good. And that, that, I think that just means there's a lot of energy in here today. Yeah, I think that's your mom. <laughs> that was so funny. I could feel it. It's actually really pretty. I feel like it should be on yeah. the desk. But we'll just kind of leave this right here. Okay. Okay. Um, So uh, we also have our amazing newsletter. So if you have not signed up, you can go to mariamenunos.com, sign up for the newsletter. We are doing amazing giveaways each week. Everything that I love, whether it's True Botanicals or um, what is the other one? Dermalogica. Dermalogica. uh, Coraz. Yeah. Any of the products I'm loving, we are talking to the brands and be like, hey, would you be in interested in being part of our newsletter so we can give you guys some good freebies. The most recent one where I have to say that I'm really excited about is the little Viper. Oh, um, yeah. They sent us so many and I'm so excited to give them away for giveaways because yeah. they're like these little pepper spray bracelets. So I told the you best. guys at some point that I really thought I had this like genius idea. I was like, what if like you could wear a bracelet and like, like Spider-Man. <laughs> and then I looked it up and that it already existed. So thank you friends at Viper for creating it. So I didn't have to go do it. And it's funny because Jenna Kutcher in her book talks about inventing this like um, drinking device for her cousin who was quadriplegic because she was like, wait, he has to wait if he's thirsty at night to drink. That's not okay. And so she went out and invented this thing and became like part of this, you know, inventor's fair in Minnesota. But, you know, when we have these ideas... You know, and you're like, I really need this and you're going to go out and do it. And I would have done it. So I'm grateful they did it because I didn't have time to do it. But uh, but they're amazing. So back to it. It's think of a Fitbit, but there's a little teeny spray can inside of Mace and it's on your wrist. So if you're walking home at night late to your parking spot or whatever, it's right there. It's not something you're going to dig for. 
Friends, you're never digging for the can of pepper spray in your purse. When was the last time you were even able to find anything you wanted? Never. Your key, your wallet, your credit card, your (laughs) chapstick. Like you can't find anything anyway. So do not think that just carrying it around in your bag is going to help you. (laughs) So this is great because it's on your wrist and you just go and you squeeze the two sides and you spray the shit out of them. Yep. And then at least you have a fighting chance. So I love them and uh, we're really grateful that they sent some so we can give them away. And uh, I, I've bought them for, you know, so many of the females in my life throughout the years because I knew that it was something that made me feel more secure when I was, you know, Mm -hmm. taking late night walks or something. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so that's in the next newsletter probably, right? Heck yeah. Okay, so sign up, mariamenunos.com. Meanwhile, um, we would probably should just get right to it with Jenna because we have so much to get into. She hosts one of the top-rated podcasts, like I said, Gold Digger. Um, That's my alarm to come in here and do this show. (laughs) And you're already here. And friends, I'm already here. I'm so all over it. Uh, She has a passion for helping others and entrepreneurs grow profitable, passionate, authentic businesses that allow them to live more and work less, which is something that she had to get to. And she's going to share how she got there because she's had a few different evolutions um, from leaving kind of her nine to five world to working for herself and then burning out working for herself and realizing, wait, this isn't the right way either because the whole idea of working for myself was being able to do what I wanted to do as I want to do it. Mm -hmm. So she's gone through a few evolutions. She has a lot of knowledge, a lot of help um, for all of us. And I learned so much by reading this and I, I love this book. Oh my God. She's like, turn into like a self-help guru. Like I felt like she was like I agree. a therapist talking me through all these things and how are you really? And I'm like, wow, we really never think about that. So without further ado, we're going to take a quick break and we're going to be right back with Jenna Kutcher. Thank you for doing this with me and thank you for sharing your platform with me. It means so much. Of course. I am so excited. So I love the book. Um, yeah. I love how you are like, not just this marketing maven, entrepreneur, building guru, you're now like self-help guru because I'm reading this book and fresh off of a Joe Dispenza, Dr. Joe Dispenza meditation event. Have you studied him at all? A little bit. Drew listens because he goes on Rogan a lot, right? I don't know. Maybe. Doesn't he? I feel like I know of him or hear his voice in our house at times. But there was Was so much like but like through you, that was very similar, right? Where it's like, are we really checking in with ourselves? Um, and, and I really loved uh, the whole part of it of like honoring your emotions and where you're at and, and knowing that they're signals. And so we're going to dive into everything because, um, I am such a fan of the book. I actually didn't even realize, but I'm matching. (laughs) <laughs> oh my gosh. Thank you. That's very, Good job. <laughs> very similar. I didn't even realize. Um, so the book is called, how Kelsey, are you? Thanks for taking me too. By oh the way. my gosh. Sweet it's girl. Jenna, It's so good. It really is so good. Oh, yeah. thank you. I'm I think all everyone. women need to see, to read this. It's funny. You're seeing the problem spots because you're coaching women every day and you see I'm in the DMS. Yeah. You're <laughs> seeing where, um, we're all falling short or just overdoing it. Um, not, comfortable with resting because that's not, I had the conversation with my husband yesterday. I said, you gotta just surrender. And he's like, but everybody needs me. I'm like, nope, we don't. We need you to get better. They don't. So give in, but that's the hardest thing for people. So, um, there's so many earmarked pages. There's so many, oh my gods. There's so many like things, but Hmm. talk about what your inspiration was behind this and did you write this like somewhere in some flowy place? Because it really feels so good when I'm reading it. Oh my gosh. Our, we're recording, right? This yeah. is actually recording. Oh, okay, yeah. good. I was like, I didn't see the little pop-up that says, Jenna Kutcher, prepare your, your life for this. Um, <laughs> so I did write it in a dreamy place. And it's actually kind of funny because before the pandemic hit, we bought this little cabin. It's this log cabin overlooking Lake Superior. And it came with this sweet little timber frame guest house. And when we bought it, I had zero thoughts or notions of writing a book. But when I walked into that little guest house overlooking the lake, I was like, if I ever write a book, it will be in that leather chair. And sure enough, months later, 
I found myself doing just that. It was kind of a premonition. It was really wild. But the idea of the book came from a massage therapist. Do you want to hear this story? It is so funny. Yes, of course. Um, By the way, all your oh, stories are funny and all your music <laughs> references. You're talking yes. about salt and pepper here and just one more try and one That's all right, these, little Lauren Hill. We got I, it all in there. I'm like reading and then I'm laughing because I can hear your voice and I'm like, yes. it's just so good. <laughs> oh, so it was in August of 2020 and it was my husband Drew and my, it was our 10 year anniversary. And I was like, we've got to do some Thing good. Like it's been a rough year. It's 2020. Right. And it was right when the world was like creeping open and we found ourselves in a town of 1200 miles from the Canada border, uh, you know, three hours away from a target. And, um, I booked us these little massages at a place called loot Zen and, uh, went in for my massage. And the woman who was giving me my massage was named Thea and I had never met her before. And she said, I'm an intuitive healer. I'll be doing your massage today. And the whole time she was massaging me, I was like, can she tell that the pressure is a little too hard? Is the table warm? Does she know what I'm thinking? Does she know that I ate a banana? Like I am like getting so in my head about this whole intuitive thing. And at the end of the massage, she goes, can I tell you what came up for you? And I said, sure, I'm open-minded, whatever. And she goes, there's something you need to do and you know what it is and you need to go out and do it. And I just got the chills. right away, she goes, do you know what I'm talking about? And I go, yep. It's, I need to write a book and it's crazy, Maria, because when you think about it, like that line could apply to anybody listening. There is something in your life that, you know, you need to do and you're not doing it. So go out and do it. And it was crazy because I went home from the massage that day and Drew was like, how was your massage? And I like still had the creases on my face and I go, I'm writing a book. And he's like, I am so confused how an hour long massage led you to this revelation of doing something you swore you would never do. Um, but that was the beginning of it. And it was really interesting because you and I have talked about this off camera about just this idea of changing and identities and changing our minds and, you know, contradicting ourselves. And that's just part of being a human. And for years I said, I would never write a book. And now here it is. Right and it's amazing. <laughs> and that's <laughs> why you, you needed to write it. Wow. Okay. Well, I'm going to go book a massage and with an intuitive healer and have her tell me what's <laughs> popping up. But I, uh, I was re-inspired to write mine that I postponed just before COVID hit, I had a deal and yep. I was going to write my book and something just didn't feel right. And I canceled it. And for, from the other side, I would have thought, oh, well, that would have been the perfect time to write it. Right. Everyone's, you know, standing still, but it just didn't feel right. And I said, you know, I can't do this right now. And I've been waiting for the right time. And I was telling Kelsey, I think this summer when I'm in Connecticut or something will be the time. Yeah. Cause I know I feel really peaceful out in my gazebo over, you know, out in the woods. And yes. I think that's when I'll something do about it. a view. There's something yeah, about it. I remember you re writing. writing about the cornfields from your uncomfortable target <laughs> yes. chair. <laughs> yes. You know, what's interesting though, too, is, and, and I would encourage you potentially because you're a lot like me, we're wired the same. When I decided to write it, I really had to mindfully protect my creativity. And I think it's something we don't do often enough. And so I did the entire process backwards. So that night after my massage, I opened up a Google doc and titled it, I'm going to write a book, not when I write a book or if I write a book. And I wrote the whole thing without a manuscript or with, without a book deal, without an agent, without a publisher. Because for me, the minute that money and deadlines yes. get involved, my creativity disappears. It's like that blinking cursor that is so dreadful. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, if I'm going to do this really hard thing, that's going to take forever. The thing I said, I would never do. I need to do it in my own timing and yeah. on my own terms. And I also want to write words that tell versus words that sell, because I think there's a difference. Once you get a book deal, you start getting people telling you what the book is mm -hmm. or what it should be or the themes or the structure. And so I don't know, I would just encourage anyone out there in any sort of project or idea or dream phase, if there is any way to protect yourself from deadlines or getting paid to do something that you're curious about, mm -hmm 
take it because your creativity will soar when you do that. Well, it kind of goes back to what you're talking about in here. There's no one person to tell you what to do. It's what's inside of you telling you what to do. So even that may not apply because the truth is some people work better with deadlines, right? So for us, absolutely, I knew I didn't want to have those constraints either. And I've gone through the process. I've written three And my first one, they were telling me I was writing a terrible book because they had a vision of what they wanted me to write. And I just was writing from a pure place. And they told me it would never, you know, don't even think a New York Times bestseller, like don't, not going to happen. And then they had to call me to tell me I was number three in the toughest category, which was advice and self-help, which I didn't even know I was in that category. So (laughs) when you talk about um, words that, um, that tell not sell, It's because you were writing from a place of want, not a place of need. And that's what I was feeling when you were talking, because when you have to get things done, now you're just forcing stuff rather than wanting to share things and it coming from a good place. So I always knew when I was going to write my next book now, it was going to be like this, where I'm not going to have deadlines. I'm not going to put pressure on myself. I'm going to write it from a good, pure place and then bring it to them. And yes. so, um, I love that. yeah, I think, I think that's again, back to your lesson, do what feels right for you. You don't have to follow everybody else's rules, your, yep. your life, your rules. Always, always. So did you have a lot of notes when you sent it to them or they were like, Oh my God. Um, so no, it was actually wild. The whole process unfolded so beautifully because, When I learned that Thea was an intuitive healer, I actually, the only thing I wanted to know would, would we be able to conceive again? Because I have a three-year-old now and we were, you know, in that phase of like dreaming again. And I had a not so easy journey to parenthood. And so when she was bringing up this work stuff, I was like, screw work. Tell me about my uterus. Like, can I do this again? (laughs) And she said, no, this work needs to come before the baby. And so it was really wild because I really felt this like deadline of like, get this done so that you can continue on with the life you want. And so I gave myself deadlines around it, but it was really beautiful because the funny thing is Maria, and you kind of hinted at this, like I run the top marketing podcast in the country. Like I'm known in the business space. I'm an entrepreneur, all these things. And when I first wrote my initial manuscript, it was a business book. And part of that, I think, comes from this identity, this notion of like who I am and what people know me as. You've dealt with this uh-huh. your entire life of like people putting you into a box of like, who is Maria and what can she do? And when I finally then did invite in the external help of an agent and going through that formal process, what they were pulling out of my book had nothing to do with business. In fact, they were like, I don't have an entrepreneurial bone in my body, but these chapters speak to me. And so it was this full restructuring. And for me, it was really stepping into this other version of myself and acknowledging, yes, I love business. I love strategy. I love marketing, but I love those things because of the life that they have given me. And you can have a life like this through other avenues. It doesn't have to be entrepreneurship. So it was really a fascinating journey, but I loved it. Like I loved pulling things apart and putting them back together. And I think it was really refreshing as somebody in the digital space where you like have an idea, you put it out there, you get feedback, you share it with the world and you move on to really sit with a project for a long time and watch it be refined through the process. But you know what also you did is you leaned into your evolution. Like you've evolved from just this hustler business person. You've evolved to another place and you embrace that new Jenna rather than being like, oh, this isn't what I do. No one's going to, but this is exactly what your audience is going to want. And a broader audience who now is going to come to you for the other stuff. Yes. Isn't it exciting? Yeah. It's really cool. I think so. I think so for sure. It actually reminded me of something that I think we all need to hear is that we're not the same person, like even every year, every day, we're continuously evolving and to not be afraid to embrace that new person, even though it might be different. Like for me, one of the things that I struggle with is I am very intuitive And I do know a lot about health. I'm not a doctor though. So then I shut myself down sometimes. I'm like, but you're not a doctor. 
But I'm like, but I intuitively know what that person needs and how they can get past it. And it's worth a shot. I might be wrong, but why not try it? Or, you know, that whole space is, is challenging because people know me as all of these other things, but I've lived in this so intensely for so long and it's where my heart feels right now. Um, where sometimes I'll be like, but you're not a doctor. Shush. (laughs) Isn't that interesting? And it's really, it's really crazy to me because I mean, even with my own fertility experiences, like those are the things that I found myself like going down the rabbit holes, like in the forums late at night, learning all of these new things where then you do become a point person. Like you've so publicly shared about your journey, your mom's journey, like all of these things. And it's fascinating because we often look at, you know, formal education as a, as the teacher, right. But like loss and like life are really great teachers. If you subscribe yourself as a student. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of times we disqualify ourselves from even being a student to like learn the things, but then beyond that point, we, we disqualify ourselves from being the teacher and not coming from a place of like, I'm an expert and I have all the certifications and all the trainings, but like I can make an impact through what I've lived and Mm -hmm. what I know. And I think that's really an interesting change of framing for people. Well, I know from listening to your show, uh, the gold digger podcast, which I had been listening to long before I even knew you. And I was learning so much. You talk about, um, you know, not being afraid, like write down all the things you feel like you are an expert in and really go for it and don't be afraid. Um, but I think that it is something that we constantly need to be reminded of. So thank you for that reminder. Um, you betcha. So let's talk about the notion of, of really digging into how are you really? Because I loved all of the, you know, the, the context around it where we're just like, yeah, good, good, busy. That's usually what I say. Fine. Fine. Good. (laughs) I'm great. Busy. Yeah. Busy, busy, busy. And then we just leave it at that. And it's just this awkward thing because I don't know what else to say to people. Or if they're like, my other awkward question is, so what are you up to? Like, oh, you know, the same, just hustling. That's usually my line because I don't (laughs) want to go any deeper because I don't know. Like, really, are we going to get into this right now? I don't know if you really want to get into it. Yes. It's fascinating. So what's really interesting is, is that to continue this story, I ended up getting pregnant with my second daughter and days before she was born, I had to name the book. And a lot of people don't realize, like for me, the name came last, like naming the book was not something that happened early in the process. And I was voice texting some of our friends that we have mutual friends and being like, help me name this book. Cause I already got to name a baby and that's hard enough. (laughs) And I kept describing the book as like the conversation where you get get past the good, busy, fine, same old, and you really feel safe to lean in to like, how are you really? And someone much smarter than me was finally like, oh, is that, is that the book? Is that the title? And I was like, oh, is it? It is. (laughs) Um, And what's so interesting to me is I feel the same way. I feel like sometimes there's two parts of this problem. Sometimes it's us being afraid to really go there, right? Like it's like, am I willing to get into it with myself? Like, am I willing to admit that I'm unhappy or that the relationship isn't right or that my career feels like a dead end? Am I okay in admitting this? Because if I admit it, it means then I got to do something about it. But the other side of it too, is do I feel safe to feel understood or at least acknowledged. And, you know, it's funny because I think good and fine and busy are fine responses if it's the barista or your podiatrist. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to craving deep relationships, I think that there's this line in the book where it's like loneliness isn't isolation. Loneliness is being in a room of people who don't know who you really are. And I just think that so many of us feel that these days where it's like, we're literally stepping into spaces, whether it's work or relationships, or even with our own families where we don't feel fully known or welcomed to show up as we really are. And so it's interesting because I feel like the timing of this book is just really divine in that as we navigate out of these last few years and we figure out what is the new normal and we've come to terms with things aren't going back, we're moving forward. We're kind of given this opportunity to reintroduce ourselves and kind of like you and I were talking about, like these identities shift from Mm -hmm. day to day 
even. Um, and it's like, first we have to meet ourselves and this version of ourselves. Then we get to introduce them to the world. And how can we do that is by being honest and inviting honesty into our lives. So how do you meet that new version of yourself? I feel like there's probably a lot of like rooting that has to go on before you go introduce yourself. So share that that oh, yeah. kind of process with everybody, because I love what you're saying. It has been, I can't even friggin' believe how long it's been and, and how, how, you know, it's been good. It's been bad. It's been up. It's been down. It's been weird. It's just so many yeah. things. Uh, yeah. but a lot of people did have the opportunity to become more aware of things and yeah. be awakened. One of the things that I think about often, and and I think this happens more so for women, but definitely across the board is that we have become shape shifters. And what I mean by that is like, depending on the room we're in or the people we're with, we will be a different version of ourselves. And I think we were taught that at a really young age. Like I watch, and I'm such a conscious parent that sometimes I drive myself wild because I'm like, okay, like how am I telling my children they need to perform in certain places or for certain things or be certain ways in certain places. And I think that as adults, especially women, we have gotten so used to conforming in order to make other people feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's beauty in that, in that our intentions are pure. We're doing it to make people feel comfortable or we're doing it to not make anyone feel left out. But in the same place, I think sometimes we don't even know who we really are. Um, well, because you have, have to abandon some life. of yourself. Yes. It's like, you're just letting pieces of you go. And, and I think too, for a long time, it was possible where it was like, you could go to work and not talk about your home life and you could be at home and not talk about your work life. And there's these separations, but I think the pandemic really flipped a lot of that notion on its head when suddenly everything and all of our roles are coexisting under one roof. If we're fortunate enough to be able to work where we live and live where we work and we can't switch roles. I remember um, being on a zoom call and it's like, I'm nursing one daughter and the three-year-old's running around and the dogs are barking. And I didn't have to apologize for the first time because Zoom life made people understand that we have lives outside of these conversations, mm-hmm. right? Like there is life constantly happening. And so when I talk about like getting to know this new identity of you, I'm also coming at it from a place where like, I'm still getting to know this version of me, this version of me, who's a mom of two, who's now an author, who's shifting into different spaces. And you were right. It does take this rooting. It takes this like grounding. It takes time. And I think that part of the problem is, and I have a chapter in the book called my soul Shavasana, where it talked about how I freaking hated at the end of yoga, where you have to just lay on the mat flat on your back in (laughs) Shavasana. I was like, I don't get it. I'm thinking about my grocery list and all the emails I need to write. If it wasn't rude, I would literally get myself up and walk out the door, but I'm going to lay here and suffer. And in our culture these days, we are so distracted and we don't know how to be with ourselves. Mm -hmm. It's like the reason why we bring our phones with us when we go to the bathroom, we literally can't sit as long as it takes to pee to be by ourselves. It's a problem. Mm -hmm. Like it's a real problem. And I think that the reality is, is that we're so fixated on these lives that look good, that we're scared to admit that sometimes these lives don't feel good. Mm -hmm. And so getting to know yourself is that grounding exercise. It's that soul Shavasana. It's laying on the mat or sitting on the toilet or whatever it is by yourself and checking in with yourself. And we often talk about like identity shifts and things like that when big life moments happen, but like, even in the day to day, like checking in with yourself. It's like when your Apple watch dings and it's like reminder, breathe. And you're like, Oh, I've been breathing, but like, they haven't been actual breaths that like fill my soul. I think we're all at that place where we need that reminder, that ping of like, it's time to check in. Yeah. I I remember the pings in here too. Kelsey, you were really like, Oh, we were using the same copy. So I have hers. (laughs) She sees my nose. She's like, I love the idea of tiny pings. I love it because it's so true. Whether it's like chills or like whatever it is, it's like those tiny pings. That's like, wow, this is important to me. Like I, I want to do something about it. I should do something about it. So yeah, I really liked that. There was this part in it where I was talking about like, have you guys ever been in a room or a space and you're learning? Actually, Maria, this is perfect. When you were with us in Napa, Uh there was a lot of conversations where you're like, 
I feel like this is important and I don't know why what this person is saying is important, but I'm going to be a sponge and I'm going to soak it up and someday I'm going to squeeze all this goodness or knowledge out of me. I feel like we go through life not willing to be the sponge. And it's kind of like when your check engine light on your car comes on, you can ignore it for a while and you'll probably <laughs> be okay. But at some point, something's going to blow up and it's going to cost you time and money and energy. And I think if people haven't hit that burnout place, they will. If they keep ignoring all of those those goosebumps or chills or those things that say, ah, oh, this is important or I need to listen. Yeah. I, I want to talk about burnout because you talk about that in here. Um, yeah. and, and I don't, I'm trying to find the spots that I was really drawn to. Um, but, but talk about kind of where you think we go wrong that leads us to the burnout and, and kind of what the way out is. Yeah. I mean, I think the world is like collectively burnt out. I think it's kind of like, you know, balance is, is now burnout. Like we, we strived for balance for many years and now it's like, how do we survive or like heal from this burnout? And I think it's a couple different things. I think that we are a culture that more is more, and we don't know where to draw a line in the sand. We don't know how to define enough for ourselves and our lives and our work. And I think part of that comes, and I feel like I'm still deconstructing this as a mom of girls, we still operate out of this place that we are waiting for someone else to give us our big break. And if we say no to something, we're going to miss our chance, right? Like mm -hmm. I look at some of these old Disney movies and it's like the girl who's the damsel in distress gets saved by this person or gets this big opportunity or gets spotted by some dude on a sidewalk in New York. And suddenly her life is different. And it's crazy because I think burnout is coming from this place of saying yes in fear that if we say no, we're going to miss our chance. Yes. And what's fascinating about that is that we are disregarding everything that has gotten us to where we are today in doing that in saying that someone else will be my savior, that someone else will give me that burn or that big breakthrough. We're leading ourselves to burnout, but we're also disregarding our gifts and the things that have gotten us this far. And so I feel like the opposite of burnout is boundaries. And I think that for so long, we've been taught that boundaries are these things that keep people and opportunities out of our lives. And so of course, it's going to be scary if we're operating from this place of like, ah, someone's going to give me this opportunity. My life will change. A boundary feels scary because it's like us actually saying no to that notion. But boundaries don't keep people and things out of our lives. They keep us in our life. Oof. And when we're not living our life and we're not awake to our life, we're feeling burnt out because we're spending our time, our currency in all of the other places beyond living. And I think that's where that exhaustion, like that bone tired feeling sinks in. And I think a lot of us have been there or we are there. Mm. Yeah. I, I love boundaries. I, we've been learning all about boundaries. I didn't know I didn't <laughs> have any. Um, although I shouldn't say I didn't have Wait, any, yeah. but yeah, I yeah, had... Yeah. I had some, it was good in therapy. Yeah. He was like, well, I know you have boundaries about what you eat. I'm like, yeah, I actually do. Okay. Yeah. There were some boundaries, but I mean, it was real bad. And that's when yeah. I realized why I had so many difficulties, why things were so challenging, because I was assuming that if things got to a really bad point and I gave you that glance, you were supposed to figure out yeah. that you've reached my boundary. But if somebody yeah. doesn't have boundaries to begin with, how are they going to even catch that glance and understand that you're pissed? They don't. Yeah. So you have to express your needs and desires. This is a whole process that I've been going through the last few months as I've been rebuilding. It's a and, tough process. Yeah. But it it's makes life so much easier, like so much easier to just say what works for you, what doesn't work for you. Yeah. <clears throat> and then if this works together, great. If it doesn't, we go out of different ways because- yeah. I don't have it in my time and life budget anymore to struggle through those yes. in-betweens with you. Yes. Can I give you a script that you can use? Yeah. For people? Yeah. Okay. So this, so, um, okay. So when I was pregnant with my now three and a half year old, it was after the years of the struggle and I really just wanted to say no to everything. Like I was just in a place where I was like, I am getting this like miracle and like, I will not miss it. Like I'll be damned if I miss it. And I told my team and for a lot of people that don't have teams, don't worry, this will still apply. And I was like, don't even 
present me with opportunities. Cause I'll say yes. Right. Like everything feels shiny. I am very excitable. Like <laughs> don't even, just don't even tell me unless Oprah emails, don't tell me. And I often think about it. I recently took my daughter bowling and like, you know how they have like the bumpers that go up so that the ball doesn't go into the gutter. Mm -hmm. I was like, I literally am a human that needs bumpers in my life so that I stay on the path. Like I stay in my lane Mm -hmm. because the second that I don't have boundaries and bumpers, I am in the gutter always in all senses. So just like you, I get tons of like amazing opportunities that are like, holy crap, these, these five years ago would have been pinch me moments, but today they're not the right thing. And so I literally have this template saved in my phone, in my email, anywhere where I'm prone to say yes. Okay. And it it'll say, so let, let's just say you invited me to like an event in LA and it sounds really cool. So I would say, dear Maria, Thank you so much for this incredible invitation. I am honestly so honored that you asked me to be a part of this. And I'm so grateful for your consideration at this time. I'm going to have to decline. And I want you to know that in me saying no, it has nothing to do with you or your invitation and only to do with me and my values. I am in a season of life where I am living out what I say is important to me. And so me saying no to you is allowing me to say yes to what matters to me. And you can fill in the blank if you want or not. Wow. And then you can just say, I will always be in your corner and cheering you on. I wish you nothing but the best. And I can't wait till our paths cross again in the future. Damn. And I literally send this out wow. all the time, but here's what I think is different because a lot of times we feel like no is a negative thing, right? Like people, we're going to offend people, whatever. But when we say no and say, it's not about you, it's all about me. It sounds like we're breaking up, um, but it's, <laughs> it's really like it protects you and it preserves yeah. the relationship and it also keeps the door open. And mm-hmm. you are just like me where I believe like everything will come back in its own time. If it's meant for me, it'll come back. Um, and I, it's a beautiful way to live because you don't feel obligated to say yes to things, but I use that all of the time. And what's crazy is that the more that I send that message out to people, the more that people respond and say, oh my God, I didn't realize that you can have boundaries or like you're teaching people, you're giving them a gift. Isn't that crazy? Even when I had an autoresponder, when I was on maternity leave, it was like the autoresponder went off and then it was like, sorry, I'm a teacher. So let me just teach you something. I used to think I could never rest, but here I am logged off for three months. So you're not going to hear back from me, but here's what you can take from this. And like, it was just funny because I'm like, people need to see boundaries being lived out because they can't just be something we hear about and not really see them applied. And it's just like when you have a dream and like you light up and then someone lights up with you, I think the same thing can happen with boundaries. Oh my gosh, Jenna, I did. I I shut down voicemail back, I think in 2008, well before anybody (laughs) did it. And I was like, guys, you can reach me by so many means. I can't, I cannot check tech voice voicemails. Just my grandpa hates that. He's like, Jen, your voicemail box is full. I'm like, grandpa, it has been full for eight years. Yeah. (laughs) Yep. It's me too. And then I, uh, Uh, Tim Ferriss inspired me for the out of office email. And I created one. It was soon after brain surgery or maybe before. I don't know. Somewhere long, long, long time ago. I said, hey, yeah. I decided to not to live by the, the you know, constraints placed on me, like by, by having to respond to everyone else's request of me and actually getting to like do what I need to do every day. Um, yeah. so I, I rarely respond, um, and I won't be really checking this. So if you need any of these things, go to these people. Yes. And it was like yes. agent for this a mailing address for that podcast, this, and at first Love it. it freaked people out and people like very Did successful it? people were like that out of, out of email thing is like real aggressive. I said, I'm so <laughs> sorry, but like, I'm dealing with a dying mom. I just got a brain tumor and I have to just focus on us right now. And I, I, at that point I'd lived such a big life where everyone had access to me, every publicist, every, you know, this person, that person. And I had trained them that I was the type a perfect person who was always going to respond. And I was like, no, 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 you can now all go through proper channels because I can't handle all of this. I will die. So I'm choosing me now. And then eventually people started being like, I really love that out of office email. And then after COVID, people are like, oh, I'm reusing this for myself. This is amazing. So yeah. It It is that culture though, too. And I think 
that is, you know, the problem with the pings and the dings and like <laughs> always being available is because it's like we are constantly distracted. And I think that that distraction can kind of be a method of numbing mm -hmm. ourselves to the reality of what we're living. It's like, um, one of my cousins is an elementary art teacher. And she said, it's fascinating because nowadays kids cannot sit down and like paint something. Like you can't just be like, here's paint, create something. You have to tell them what to create. We've lost our ability to even be creative or to like ideate, which is terrifying, Scary. but it's like, when you think about it, we fill every spare minute with just scrolling. And so, yeah, it is, it's just a really fascinating notion of like, how do we invite boundaries into our lives to keep ourselves in the actual life and not yeah. just online? It's yeah. Crazy. And doing what you want to do. Um, I want to talk about emotions because you, you talk about kind of disqualifying emotions and feeling like you should be blessed you're in this place. And there was a whole part in the book that just, uh, I connected with so intensely in there and I think everyone else will. So let's talk about that and also how not every feeling is a choice. Yes. Okay. So my toddler again has been a huge teacher in this because she's a deep feeler. Like she really is just this kid who deeply feels, who is really conscious of other people's feelings, who's really impacted by the way that other people are feeling. Like she kind of can like catch up on people's emotions. And I was thinking a lot about in our lives, how we've kind of been taught that like happiness is the goal, right? Like you, if you wake up sad, just keep on going until you're happy today. And like happiness is the destination. And I feel like that messaging is really toxic and it's like not a real lived experience in the sense of like, our emotions, like we shouldn't try to skip through our emotions just to land on happiness. Because I think a lot of adults walking around today are people who have these childhood traumas that they've buried just to get back to happy. And now they're deeply unpacking them, whether it's in therapy or relationships or conversations. And I always go to the line with my daughter, Coco, like feelings are meant to be felt. Like, how are you feeling? And, and my dad will laugh because we're from Minnesota. He's like, like a mill worker. He hates talking about feelings. Mm -hmm. And so my three-year-old will be like, Papa, come sit with me. Let's talk about how I'm feeling. And like, he just like rolls his eyes like, oh dear God. But it's beautiful <laughs> because we give her the ability to express, you know, I'm frustrated or I'm sad or I'm worried or whatever these are. And it's like, as adults, we feel all of those things as well, but we tend to rush through or we tend to numb them. And a lot of it too comes from like the language around how we talk about our feelings. We like to place the blame on our feelings. Like this is making me feel, but we don't acknowledge that like I'm a human being that just feels things. Um, and so one of the things that I've had to do a lot, and it kind of comes back to the whole topic we've been talking about is like, when you check in on yourself, like, how are you really, where in your life are you suppressing these feelings mm -hmm. that could be guiding you towards something greater or could be signaling something that you need to move away from? Like, have you, I mean, you've had, I'm sure a million friends where it's like, they're going through the breakup and you're like, did you have any red flags? And they're like, oh yeah, I just had this feeling in my gut that like something was off. And you're like, why are we ignoring these feelings? Like, especially as women and like, you're super intuitive. And I feel like I have some blessings in that area as well. And it's like, the more in alignment I am with the things I'm feeling, the better I am showing up and the greater the work that I'm doing is. But and I so think we're hiding those feelings. <clears throat> we're, we're avoiding those red flags because we're either so burnt, so tired, so beaten. We just want a little bit of grace and a little bit of fun. So I think you yeah. are, it's so easy. Like, so how many people get married that know they shouldn't get married, right? They do it because they're like, oh, but, but we're planning the wedding and it's going to be so yes. pretty and it's going to be so nice and I'm going to have my moment. And there's so many of those things that we overlook for the other things yeah, I think. Well, and it's like this idea of identity foreclosure. And um, I had an amazing guest on my podcast, Dr. Maya Shanker. And she talks about this notion of like, why is it that we like hold on to genes that haven't fit us in 10 years or that we finish the degree because we're already two years in and heaven forbid, we recognize that we have a changed mind. We keep going for the next two years because we wouldn't want to waste the two. So we end up wasting four. Or as you and said in the book, idea, you don't want to be a quitter. 
Yes. And it's like, we cling to these things because we look at what we lose versus what we could gain. And it's really interesting because I think about often how as human beings, it's like, we cling to those identities. Mm -hmm. Like we're the ones that aren't letting those pieces of ourselves go or saying like, Oh, I've changed or I'm different, or I've changed my mind. And that's actually holding us back just as much as like the societal expectations of like, you go to college, you get married, you have the degree, like all these things. Like we're also part of that perpetuation of that messaging because we're just following suit instead of listening to those gut feelings of like, maybe I could do this differently, or maybe this isn't meant for me, or maybe I should try something else. So it is really interesting. Or even, you know, I had a conversation with a friend recently who had built this business and started realizing she was miserable in it, hated it. Um, I'm like, I know that feeling. Um, and so, <laughs> you know, and then you're like, you're so deep. You've put so much of your time, so much of your money and all of this in that you're like, well, I have to see it through so I can get a return. And yes. sometimes the return is you're like the lessons, the lessons you had where you took it. I mean, what, what's the percentage of businesses that, um, fail or even succeed? You know, this. Yeah. It's like within 10 years, I think it's like 3% are still alive 10 years from now. So like yeah. five years, it's like, I mean, it's very, it just keeps dropping and dropping and dropping. And I'm sure those numbers are only less because of COVID, you know? Yeah. So, so know Crazy. that and know that you're in, you know, the same club as everybody else, but find what was good about it and, and cut your losses because it's your emotional money now that you're spending <gasps> yes. your spiritual yes. money you're yes. spending your mental money yes. you're spending and that's not worth anything like okay no. cool peace out yes I spent all that money I don't want to die for this because I'm miserable and if you're doing something you're miserable at it's yes. just gonna happen like it's not it's good too, the cost of it is too expensive when you think about time it's like we can't go out and earn more time you can always go out and earn more money like Anyone can figure out ways to earn more money, but you can't get back your time. I think too, it's like, we are a culture that has gotten so accustomed to trading time for money that we forgot to look at time as the ultimate currency. Like that is the one thing that we can't go out and do. And there's this, this part in the book and it's written from a different perspective, but I think it pertains to this where I was talking about like grief and loss. And like, if anyone knows that to you, um, but it was talking about how, again, we're so desiring to move on, but we have to recognize that we need to move forward. And there's this line that says that like, we're not meant to move on from our grief. We're meant to pick it up and move forward with it. And what I think about this and why it pertains here is that if we're learning lessons, like these lessons can strengthen us. Like, I think we all learn so much more when we fail or when we try something and we're like, ah, that wasn't the right fit for me. Or like, I don't know what I was thinking. That was Mm -hmm. silly. Um, but I think a lot of times we're so deeply desiring, like, let's just go back and erase this. And it's like, don't erase these things. Like these are going to be your greatest teachers. And like, as you learn to move forward with the lessons you learned, you're getting stronger, but you're also getting smarter. Mm -hmm. And I just think we, as a culture, especially with things like social media, where it's like, we want the before and the after, we don't want to see the middle. And we deeply desire showing up when we have all the answers or when things look good. And how many people do you know where they're like, Hey, remember when I was online and I, it looked like I was on top of the world, but behind the scenes, I was miserable. It's like, we don't know what the before and afters even are yet. We're desiring to skip that middle part. And that's where all the work happens. Mm -hmm. And so it's crazy because it's like, I look at social media these days and it's like these peer reviewed journals where it's like, look at me. Do you like this? Is this working? Is this good? And instead we're like missing out on like our actual lives, like the middle parts that people one can relate to, but that like will connect us so much deeper than being like, ah, I figured it out. And now here it is. And you know, I hope you, (laughs) I wish you well on your journey, you know? Yeah. It doesn't ever really work out like that. And also the pain points are the ones that push you and propel you to get the answers that then unlock this whole other level of the video game. I call it always a video game um, where like we just discovered loom and I love you just discovered loom. Oh my God, Jenna, that, that mastermind (laughs) changed my life because now I had so many of you that I could learn from and access, you know, we did your Pinterest and your newsletter class and that helped us so much over here. And the boss babe girls taught me about, 
um, loom. And I was like, God, this has been such a pain point my whole life. Yes. But I was yes. on that hamster wheel 24 seven, didn't have time to come off. I just kept suffering and suffering and suffering and suffering and suffering. And now I have a solution. So if Pooja no has an emergency, someone can pop in and have a much easier job helping and, and stepping into that role rather than me having to figure out how to train them or Kelsey having to get away from her stuff. She has to do go train. Like, but it really required, and maybe I'm, you know, slow to this. It really required like 20 something years of suffering to get to that point, but I learned it. <laughs> Isn't it crazy? Well, there. and it is, it is funny too, because it's like, there are certain things in our lives where we just like keep doing them, even though they hurt or they don't feel right, or they're, they're stuck. And it's like, we would just take, it's kind of like, I literally, this is happening in my life in real time. I like need to go to the DMV. My license expired two months ago and I haven't done it. And I spend every day dreading going to the DMV mm -hmm. when really it is going to take me less than an hour of my life to go do it. Yeah. And all of this mental stress around this stupid thing it's, it's that I'm wasting you. We're like going through our lives doing that because we're like, we're avoiding the uh -huh. one thing that would simplify or make it all better. Yeah. And so we're just spending our lives worried about the one thing. It's like, we just did that thing. Yep. Or we that release so much. Or that room that's like a mess yeah. that you haven't cleaned up and organized. Yes. And it just, you're dragging it with you every day. If you yes. just take that Saturday to clean it, you're yes. going to actually feel good in the process too. I promise you'll dread it up until the moment you start. And then yeah. as it's coming together, you're gonna be like, Oh my God, weight's lifting off. Why didn't I do this earlier? Anyhow, I, I loved the living someone else's vision for your life. Mm, and yes. I think like your journey through all of your kind of phases was really fascinating. So I don't know if you can weave some of that in, but yeah. you know, from your you know, human yes. resources to photographer. And now you're like, okay, I'm going to be out on my own, but now I'm now uh, like stuck in my own stuff. I can't even have my own coffee. And, you know, it, now you're getting the same thing, but it's, you're running the ship until you were able to then, you know. Yes. There's this line where it was like, I quit the job, but I didn't quit the game oh, because yes. when I, Worked the nine to five. I remember I had this just, yeah, sometimes you just have those aha moments that will never leave you. And I remember sitting in my boss's office and she was a woman with two children and she never talked about her kids like ever. And I remember sitting at by her desk and seeing this picture of these cute little kids. And I asked her about her children and she kind of like looked really sad and just was like, you know, if I'm lucky, I get home and I do bath time and they go to bed. And like, that was kind of how they were existing. And that's how most and people exist. Yes. And in her, in that meeting, she presented me a five-year plan and I was like, oh my God, this is not what I want for my life. Like they never asked me, what do you want in five years? Or how do you want to feel? Or do you want the promotion? Or do you want the extra responsibility? It was just like, here's your life planned out for you on paper. And I remember going back to my office and there's this picture of Drew and myself, and I still have the picture and, um, I remember being like, do I want to spend my days, like looking at a picture of the person I love and doing work just to pad a bank account that I won't even enjoy? Or do I want to like spend my days with the person I love doing work that allows us to be together? And, you know, I, I ended up leaving that job and becoming a photographer, teaching myself every piece of running a photography business and went on to do that for years. But then again, life happened, it changed. And there's this line in the book that's like, maybe you haven't arrived because the map that you're following was someone else's, like someone else's destination is not going to lead you closer to you. And it's interesting because, you know, I love to teach, like I love teaching strategy. I love teaching principles. I love teaching frameworks. I love all of that, but all of that can be adopted, but there's this piece of the puzzle in personal development, which is personal, right? Like we are all different. And it takes this self-awareness. It takes this understanding of who you are and how you're wired and how you tick and how you learn and how you implement. And I think we've forgotten that in this culture that is so desperate to seek answers. Like there is no shortage of knowledge, but there's a massive shortage of people actually applying the knowledge, right? Like taking the steps, implementing. And so throughout my life, I feel like I've had, like, I get off course and then I have to course correct. It's like the old school garments. It's like redirecting, redirecting, like here's an alternative route. And I feel like a lot of my life has been spent on these alternate routes, trying to get back to like my compass. Like what mm -hmm. is my definition of success? Like 
I truly do believe that we can have it all, but we have to define what all is. And for me, having it all means feeling peace in all areas of my life. It's not having things. It's like the feeling, like the Mm -hmm. feeling of like not dreading your day or like looking at your calendar and being like, who booked all these things? Oh wait, it was me. Like, and so, um, you know, it's just this interesting idea of how do we like come back home to ourselves, but how do we pick a destination on the map that's right for us? And then how are we honest about where we're starting? Because Mm -hmm. like, if I handed you a map and said, come to Minnesota, Maria, but you were like, oh, I'm over here in Kentucky when really you're in California, you're not going to get to where you want to go. And I think that's where the scary part is, is like, where am I starting? Like, where am I today so that I can drop the pin on the map in the right place, but also have the right directions that are fueled by me. Like maybe it didn't work for you because it didn't come from you. And I think that's a part and piece that we forget. What about for the person who's listening, who doesn't have it in them to do it on their own, right? Not everybody's meant to be an entrepreneur. It's a really, really, really hard path, really hard path. So for those people who know that they aren't meant for that, because that does take an extraordinary amount of burden and work to do. Um, and you know, if they're honest with themselves, you you have to be honest, like, do I really want to do that? Because it's going to take it's going to take the seven days, seven nights and (laughs) decades to get there, whatever. And so there is a lot of sacrifice that comes with that. And then eventually you'll reap the reward of being able to, you know, live the life that you want the way you want it. But if there's that someone who is Jenna, who is in that office, who is looking at her husband's picture, is there a way that they can find that joy? um, Mm -hmm. And and how would you guide them? Yeah. Well, first I think that anyone that claims that they're self-made is full of it. Um, I think that we all have had helping hands in our lives, Mm -hmm. but one of the things that I really recognized for myself is especially after I had my daughter and I recognized like, I cannot white knuckle this business alone. I need help. Um, I recognize that like, I'm a visionary. I think a lot of entrepreneurs are visionaries, right? Like they have these like wild visions of like what they want for their business or their life or how they want to move through or what their work is. But the people that come alongside them are the missionaries. If you're not a natural born visionary, find someone whose mission you believe in or a company or a nonprofit, or even just within your own life in your family and live out that mission. Like the work that I do, I cast the vision, but my team are the missionaries and most of them don't want to be in the spotlight. They have zero desire to start the business, but they just believe in the work that we're doing. And I think that true fulfillment comes when we actually enjoy our work, but we believe that our Mm -hmm. work makes a difference. It can happen inside of corporations. It can happen inside of nine to fives. It can happen inside of homes as parents. It can happen anywhere, Mm -hmm. but you have to look at yourself as this missionary on this mission that you believe in because a life of fulfillment, a life of peace comes from that deep belief that what you're doing in your existence matters. And I think that we all want to feel that way. Like when we go to bed at the end of the day, we want to say like, is the way that I showed up, like, did that make a difference? Like, do I matter? Like, does this matter? And I think the only way that we can answer that question, yes, is if we are looking at our lives as like being missionaries on some sort of mission, which is going to look different for all of us, Mm -hmm. but a mission that we are not just bought into, but a mission that we are really keen on spreading and making a difference with. And so I don't think entrepreneurship is the answer for most people. I think entrepreneurship is really hard. And that's why I'm so grateful that my book shifted from a business book to something so much wider, because for me, entrepreneurship was that vehicle to live the life that I wanted. But for anyone else, it is really finding fulfillment in the mission of what you're doing. I love that. That was like Queen when we were watching, we crashed. We crashed. You got Mm -hmm. to see how many people were behind their mission. Did you see that show? No, oh, it was so oh, good. Crazy. It's crazy. Or even um, the, dropout. the dropout. Yeah, everybody on on Team Theranos was like, at first, they were all a part of that mission, and yes. I believe that. I think that's. I'm so glad we talked about that. That's like maybe my favorite part of this because, you know, we get so much advice in life, and again, you have to be careful of what you're listening to because sometimes it sounds appealing, but yeah. it's not really going to resonate with you, or it's not really what you're made of or what you want. Like. 
it's it's uh, it's really good advice, and um, and I think that's going to be really helpful for a lot of people because maybe this nine to five isn't the right nine to five because they're not feeling like they're making a difference and a missionary, yes. but maybe there's another one that they can now look towards and transition into um, rather than just feeling like, oh, I can't be an entrepreneur. So that's the end of me. I'm just going to see yes. my husband from a picture and be miserable. I love that. Um, I also want to talk about the power within us. Um, how do we access this power? How do we see this power um, and, and anything else you can share with that? Yeah. When I think about that, I often think about our intuition and I recently was watching my daughter FaceTime, my mom dancing naked, singing, let it go. And just <laughs> like unashamed and just so vibrant and full of life. And I was like, where do we lose that? Like, where do we start to like worry about what people think? Or when we start to pay attention to like what we should do, and I just want to like keep her in a little bubble so that she stays that way for the rest of her days. But I often visualize almost like the dial of a speaker where it's like, we're our intuition dial is turned so low that we don't even know how to hear it anymore. Like we'll hear those little whispers or those nudges, or we'll get those goosebumps and we just disregard them. Oh, it was the air conditioner. Oh, that was just my negative voice. Oh, that was that thing. My mom said to me, that's not coming from me. Um, and it's interesting because I always have this like visualization of like turning the noise of the world down and turning the noise of our intuition up, like making it go from like a whisper to like a yell. And when we think about like the power within us, it's like, no one took it from us. Like, um, one time when I was telling someone about my book, she was like, Oh, your book is going to empower a lot of people. And I didn't like that because I was like, when did we lose the power? Like it's, it's not my job to give people the power. It's already within us. It's, it's my job to like enrich their lives in a way that makes them see that it was never gone. It's always been there. They can always tap into it. And I think that when we look at women, especially these days, we often look out for every piece of advice, or we look to what is she doing or how is she doing this? Or how is she parenting? Or what was her career trajectory? I'm going to write this down so I can follow it step by step. And we forget to like cast eyes on like ourselves and like, what, what do I have in me? What is my gift? And I feel like we've touched on it throughout these different topics of like identity and mission work and, you know, checking in with yourself. But it's just fascinating to me because there's such a kick on this empowerment phase. And I think it's beautiful. I think being empowered is gorgeous. But then that question to me is like, where do we lose it? And how do we just come home to it? Cause it's there. It's never not been there. Um, and so how do we tap back into that? How do we? By getting quiet with ourselves and like, you know, for me, it, so this is interesting, but even in the book, I'm already contradicting myself months, months after I handed in that manuscript. I, I said in my book, like, I'm not somebody who meditates and I've been recently like getting into meditation <laughs> Me too. and part of it was because I believed that meditation was having an empty brain, right? Like I was like, my brain is too busy to do this. And somebody said to me on my podcast, they were like, oh no, it's not about like clearing your brain. It's about just noticing, like paying attention. Like notice your thoughts and release them. Like just, just let them be like, you know, don't judge them. And I feel like coming home to ourselves or like feeling the power within us is that it's noticing, it's paying attention again. It's noticing those pings. It's noticing the goosebumps. It's, it's saying like, I see you and I'm, I'm hearing you. I know in my marriage, like one of the greatest things I can do as a wife, it's just simply notice Drew. I noticed you took out the garbage today. Thank you. I noticed you ran to the bank. Thank you. Why do we not do this to ourselves? I don't know. I think we're paying attention to everyone else and everything else. Um, but I think just like meditation is not controlling, but surrendering and noticing, I think the same goes for the power within us. It's not trying to control the power or not saying, okay, power, let me know which way to go. I don't know anymore, but simply getting quiet enough to start paying attention and noticing. And for me, it's changed everything. I'm like now a person who meditates because I stopped trying to control my thoughts and just simply started noticing. And I think in doing that, it really taught me lessons in how I can notice myself throughout my day even more. Isn't it wild how we can change? Can I tell you, I actually felt the difference in you when you first popped up. Really? And I couldn't put my I finger feel on it. it. It's energy. Yeah. It, is, it is. And you know, what's crazy, Maria? 
I have never had less sleep in my life because of my children ever in my entire life. And I have never been more energetically aligned ever. Okay. So what meditation are you doing and for how long? Yes. Okay. So it's on Spotify, so it's free. So there's zero, like your listeners can listen. Um, East forest. Have you ever heard of him? Mm -mm. Um, so it's East forest. I, I was first introduced to his music through yoga. Like he has just these beautiful like songs, but he has this Spotify collection of meditations. I'll send him to you, but it's like meditation for an anxious heart. There's one called sing me awake. That is like so good. There's one called the eternal internal flame that I listened to yesterday. And it's funny too, because I'll invite Coco if she ever wants to come sit by me while I'm working, I'll, I'll always let her come sit by me. And there was one on the other day and it was like, I am peace. And Coco was like, I am peace. Aww. And then like, and it was like, so cool. Cause she like started repeating it. And I was like, Oh my gosh, this is like incredible. But I was like, these are the messages we need. So East forest, there's meditations, they're guided meditations on Spotify free, and they are so good. And I find myself sending them to people too, because I feel like when I'm doing it, I'll think of someone and be like, I just need to forward this on. I don't know Mm -hmm. what's going on, but I'm just thinking of them and maybe it's helpful. Maybe it's not kind of like what you were saying with medical stuff, Yeah, but I'm just going to send it and let Mm -hmm. them take care of it. Oh my God. I've been doing the same thing. Um, Marie for, because we're intuitive. Yes. And Marie, we just had a conversation me with the Joe Dispenza stuff. Cause I had interviewed him here years ago and she reconnected me. She's like, Maria, I'm telling you, you got to go to this meditation event. And I said, yeah. I'd rather gouge my eyeballs out than go to a meditation event. I, <laughs> I'm i so entrenched in self-help and healing and all of that, yes. but that one thing I don't think I can do. And so I did the online courses. My life was changing yeah. before my eyes. Then I did the event. And I don't think my husband has hugged and kissed me as much as he has in these Aww. last, let's say, three weeks in maybe 20 years. He is obsessed with me now because I'm floating <laughs> and happy. I'm meditating for 90 minutes between 1 and 4 a.m. every night and doing multiple meditations throughout the day. Like every time I start getting a little not okay, I'll just yeah, sit angsty. down for yeah. a little 30 minutes, something or other. Um, I'm doing walking like 90 minute meditations in the weekends. It's unbelievable, but your life totally changes when it clicks. But again, back to what you said in the book, one guru isn't meant for all. So this, this meditation works for you. Roll with it. My meditations are working for me. I'm rolling with it. Find something because what I feel, I want everyone to feel. Isn't it crazy too? Because it's like, I mean, I was the same way with rest where I was like, oh, I'm just a human that doesn't require rest. I just operate at a higher level. And it's like, we, I need to work just as hard at resting as I do at working. Like I can work, work is my go-to work is easy. Resting takes like applied focus, Mm -hmm. same thing with meditation. And it's fascinating because I think a lot of us, it's like running where it's like the first mile always sucks. Right. And then you like hit that breakthrough and you're like, oh, this isn't so bad. I got Mm -hmm. this. So many of us get stuck before we even lace up our shoes. It's like we disqualify ourselves. And I did that for myself for so long. This is a funny meditation story though. But yesterday we got like, we're kind of going off the deep end on some of this, but we got like a PEMF mat. We oh, lay I'm on, so I laid on. Too. They're amazing. Higher <laughs> doses. So what I got. I what had, on, had on an the eye beamer. mask. They're Oh, like the, like the red light? No, it's, um, well, I don't know what it is technically, but they're, it's like the, it moves your circulation electromagnetic. and yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yes. Okay, it like on. makes like a force field through your body. Basically oh. like the science behind it is that like our red blood cells are all clumped together. And so when you lay on this mat, it separates them, which means there's more room for like energy and nutrients. You mm-hmm. just lay on it. It has infrared heat. It feels really good. Coco loves to lay on it. But anyways, I was laying on the mat, had on my eye mask. It was like the middle of the day. It was like this window of time that I had 20 minutes. I'm laying there and the meditation is like, you have nowhere to be, but here right now. And all of a sudden I was like, I'm supposed to be at a doctor's appointment for Quinn right now. And I was like laughing so hard. <laughs> and I like called the doctor's office. And I'm like, I'm so sorry. I was just meditating. And they told me I had nowhere to be. And I just remember that I'm supposed to be there right now. <laughs> That's funny. Um, I was like, it was just hilarious. And anyways, I was able to reschedule it. So I got back to my meditation, but it was That's one of those funny. funny things where I was like words. I never thought I would speak. Like I was meditating and this happened. I <laughs> trust me when I was on uh filling in for Kelly Ripa and I'm talking about this, I'm like, I yeah. never thought thought this would be me. 
and now it is in a billion years. But I'm really glad you talked about rest because I did want to ask you about that. And then one more question after that, and we'll let you go. But yeah. you know, rest is such a hard thing for us to adopt and be okay with. And when you think about the health ramifications, right, of not resting as opposed to resting, your body needs time to heal and to, and to do all the things it's supposed to do. And if you're just constantly running and and moving and thinking, you're not giving any care to your brain or your body, but we're so bad about it. And like I said, even my husband Mm -hmm. feels like everything's going to fall apart. Now I've had so many moments now where I've realized things don't fall apart. It all just works itself out somehow, some way. We'd like to think egotistically the world can't run without us, but it can and it will and it does. So any tips you have to share with people how to kind of override that thinking and actually start looking at rest as a really important part of your day? Yeah. Well, I think that rest, we feel like rest has to be earned, right? And I was recently being really introspective about this notion of productivity because I love productivity and efficiency. Like that stuff lights me up. I get nerdy about it, but had this realization that like we're working on being more productive so that we can work more. And that's a problem, oh, right? Oh my like, God, wait, that just hit me. Yes. Yes. Where it's like, how can I save time so that I can spend more time saving time? And that's like, we're not, it's crazy. So there's this story in the book and it talks about this Buddhist monk and he goes to New York city and the tour guide is like, Hey, if we take the subway, we can save ourselves 10 minutes. And so they go down into the depths of the city, take the subway, they come up and the Buddhist monk goes and sits on a bench. And the guy goes, what are you doing? And he goes, I'm going to enjoy the 10 minutes we just saved. And I, that I story that. has like just stuck with me because it's like, we are working hard to save time so that we can work more. And we're also walking around thinking that like rest, it has to be earned mm-hmm. and it's not our birthright. Like it is like, it is a requirement in our lives. Like I tell my daughter who has been waking up at two in the morning and having very deep conversations with me as a three-year-old <laughs> would, I'm like, <laughs> your body needs rest and your, your hair is going to grow longer while you rest. Your, your bruises are going to heal. Like your body, this is your body's time to just be, and we have to let it be. And I'm like telling her all these messages and I'm like, Oh, we need this too. But it's fascinating because, um, in the book, when I talk about that soul Shavasana, it was like the first time I'd ever taken time off. And it's funny. Cause it's like, you, you like the idea for like two minutes and then you get the itch again. And it's almost like we have to take the concept of like a couch to 5k, but do it in reverse. We're all running the 5k pace every day. How do we learn to like sit our asses on the couch and just be, and like, how do we, like, it starts with like 10 minutes a day or like meditating for 20 minutes a day. It starts small. And then we can take a full weekend off and then we can take a week off and then maybe even a month off. Oh my gosh, what a concept. But it's like, we rest is not easy for us. So we just give up in the pursuit of rest. And it's like, no rest takes work. In fact, rest might take you more work than working does, but it is worthy. And when you start to honor that, you start to crave it. And now I crave rest. Yeah. Like I, I had never even gave myself the taste buds to understand what rest could taste like <laughs> because I convinced myself that I just needed to work all the time. I love you. I have I about a billion you. more things I could ask you, but I'm not going to take up more of your time. Um, but we will have to do more. And it has yes. been a long time coming, by the way. Um, yes. So friends, the book, How Are You Really Living Your Truth? One Answer at a Time is available now. We will put links to everything in the summary of this episode, including Jenna's Instagram handle and her podcast and everything, Jenna, that you are going to want after this, if you haven't already gotten to her. All right, friends. She's amazing. I love her. The best. She's just a ball of light, too. But I did feel a different grounding to her Mm, today. When you had seen her... Yeah. A couple months ago. Interesting. Yeah. Just, there was just like a little, like a little something like that. Yeah. Well, cause she has a lot of energy. She's only 34, which like makes me feel like, whoa, I'm like, you're only 34 years old, mm-hmm. but yeah, she's such a, she, I, she kind of reminds me like, I have that energy that's like, <laughs> but she's, she did seem very like energetic, but like but grounded. Calm energetic. Yeah, yeah. It's grounded. Yeah. So that's so interesting. You guys are everyone's connected on this meditation journey. What did you guys take from this? Let's see. 
going to my notes. I really, I actually wrote out the whole boundary script because I mean, I still massively. You wrote it out yeah. as if you can't go back. I love it. Well, yeah, because I want to use it. Like she said, I want to keep it on my uh, desk or something or wherever. I'm like still really struggle with that. And I know that it like affects me massively. And so I really liked that. I also, like I said, I wrote in the book that I really liked those like little, um, the, the chi- whether it's the chill or the, the pings. pings. Like it. So I want to try and start listening to that more and more. I have a very intense intuition I feel like and I have ignored it for a long time so I'm like you know what girlfriend we're gonna listen to that and I loved that so um I like that I did really like the visionary and missionary thing it's like you don't have to force yourself into being a visionary not everyone's a visionary so get behind someone Mm -hmm. whose vision you do believe in yep um yeah those are just a couple things because that was really I've never heard anybody talk about it yeah talk about that that was really really powerful because It's so easy to just, you know, glamorize someone's experience. Like Bethany Frankel, like no one saw all the seeds she had to plant to get there. It is not for everyone. And, um, and so I think it was such a great way to, to lead people, um, to really see that there is another option because when you don't feel there's another option, then you try to force that one and then you get into that and you're like oh shit that doesn't work that right. sucks well and like she was saying it's like if you're on someone else's path it's not gonna ever be your life right mm-hmm. it's not gonna pan out because it's not your path so yeah i love that it's like there's there's options you don't it's not one size fits all yeah. so i think that's so cool yeah Pooj. yeah that was that was my biggest takeaway is everyone's version of success is different and there's no right one but i think we're you know like she said taught like okay, check all the boxes. I went to a good college. I met like a good partner. I had my kids. I have a nice house. I have like my five, you know, 501k with my decent paying job. And we feel like that's what we're supposed to be striving for. But I feel like now more than ever, especially with the pandemic, everyone's like, but is that really what I want? Mm. And it's okay if that's not what you want and not letting all the noise of society taint that and make you feel bad or crazy Mm -hmm. or wrong for for having a different version of what you think success is and there's no wrong way so i i loved that a lot personally me too all right friends tell us what you thought in the comments below if you're watching on youtube and if you haven't hit subscribe please do we have amazing conversations like this every single day um and you can subscribe on apple Podcasts. we'll leave a link to that in the summary so uh that's it for us today In the meantime, be nice people, make good choices, and be present. This podcast and all related content published or distributed by or on behalf of Maria Menounos or mariamenounos.com is for informational purposes only and may include information that is general in nature and that is not specific to you. Any information or opinions expressed or contained herein are not intended to serve as or replace medical advice, nor to diagnose, prescribe, or treat any disease, condition, illness, or injury, and you should consult the healthcare professional of your choice regarding all matters concerning your health, including before beginning any exercise, weight loss, or healthcare program. If you have or suspect you may have a healthcare emergency, please contact a qualified healthcare professional for treatment. Any information or opinions provided by a guest expert or host featured within website or on company's podcast are their own, not those of Maria Menounos or the company. Accordingly, Maria Menounos and the company cannot be responsible for any results or consequences or actions you may take based on information or opinions.